I tell you, they, uh, one of the hardest things when we were not being able to meet as a church was to preach uh, without having worship first. You know, it was all broken up. They did the worship time one night, and then I was preaching like on a whatever day it was, and we mixed it all together. And, but without that, without that time of worship, it was just so much harder to preach. We're in a series called Masterpiece in Progress. That's what we are. We are God's masterpiece, but we're progressing. We are in process, going through a process of transformation, of regeneration, of God working in each of our hearts to help, help us become more like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And this summer, we've been looking at one verse, Philippians chapter 4, and verse 8. So far, we've gone through whatever is true, and then we went through whatever is noble. And this morning, we're going to be talking about whatever is right. Whatever is right. Boy, that word right is used a lot today in our culture. Whatever is right. I remember um, growing up, and uh, this phrase came out a lot back in the 70s, uh, maybe early 80s, but might makes right. Might makes right. You know, we're in this Cold War uh, with the Soviet Union at that time, and, and that phrase kept on coming up. Might makes right. And then you had people on the other side saying, right is what you feel in your heart. Whatever you feel in your heart, trust your heart. Whatever's in your heart is right. And then I, as I grew in my faith, I um, would talk to people who would deny the existence of God. They were atheists and they would say, God does not exist. And I'm going to tell you something, though. They had, they had a chokehold on their definition of right. They felt intensely about what they believe to be right. This is right. This is wrong and this is right. But as I thought about it, and as I studied, I came to realize if, if you use the word right, then you have to assume that something is wrong, okay? So saying that something is right, that I am right, then you're making the assumption that something else is wrong. So you have wrong and right, good and evil. But if you say something is right, and so you assume that there's something wrong, then you also have to assume a moral law that determines what's right and wrong, good and evil. And if you assume a moral law, then you need to assume a moral law giver who passes the moral law down, who tells you what's right and what's wrong. But the moral law giver, God, is what they're arguing against. But then how do you, if there's no... God, no moral law giver, and you have no moral law, erase those two things, then how can you even use the word right? Based on what are you right? Based on how you feel, your own perspective? But that's not how people present it. When they say they're right, they mean they're right. It's not opinion. It's an absolute fact. Something else that kind of was jumping out at me over the last couple of months was this new slogan, this new phrase, cancel culture. So I heard cancel culture, cancel culture. And so I, I looked up the definition of cancel culture, and here's what it means. It refers to the popular practice of withdrawing support from people or companies after they have done or said something considered objectionable or offensive. In other words, wrong. It is generally performed on social media in the form of group shaming. So now what we're doing is if someone, if, I, if I'm right and you're wrong, I'll make sure you're group shamed to the point where you wish you weren't really alive. So in other words, what they're saying is if you do something or say something that is by someone else's definition objectionable, which in this case they would say is wrong, they then will destroy, and I mean destroy your life, reputation, job, everything. They will destroy your life because to them that is right, and you deserve it because you, went, you were opposed to what they thought was right, so you're wrong, therefore your life is going to be totally destroyed, and this is the right thing to do, and you deserve it. I also find it fascinating 
that there seems to be, as I kind of process this through as a pastor, there seems to be no chance of redemption or forgiveness once you've been judged and found guilty. Okay? No, no, no redemption. Once you've been judged and you've been found guilty of being wrong in someone else's eyes who thinks they're right based upon what we're not really sure, um, then you, you, there is no redemption. There is no... And here, just so you understand, the, this whole uh, cancel culture is really an, an, an Eastern um, practice that has been repackaged for our Western culture. This isn't new, okay? This is just another philosophy that's coming. It's an Eastern philosophy that's practiced in other parts of the world that is being now repackaged and placed upon our Western culture. And so if you do something outside of or it's objectionable to those who are whoever, all right, then um, your life is pretty much going to be toast. Now, before I move on, I want to say this. This is important. Um, I, I don't want this morning to be a time where you're thinking in your mind, yeah, those people, yeah, those people, we'll get those people. Let's, let's, let's reflect on our own lives. Let's reflect on our own attitudes. Let's reflect on our own perspectives. Let's reflect on what we consider right and ask ourselves, why do we consider something right or wrong? Is it in our own minds? So my question this morning is, who decides what's right and wrong? And then once we ask who decides what's right and wrong, then how, how do you decide? How do they decide what's right and wrong? Because you think about this, I thought my truth was my truth because I believe it, and your truth is your truth because you believe it. These are just things that I've learned as I've grown here and listened to other people. I thought that shaming someone was hateful and self-righteous. To shame someone for how they live or how they think is, is, is it's, it's, it's self-centered, it's, it's, it's self-righteous, it's a hateful act. I thought it was wrong to judge other people, right? Judge not. You can't judge someone else. I thought it was wrong to be intolerant. I thought it was, I thought it was wrong, or actually, I thought it was none of your business how anyone else chooses to live their lives. That, that's, that's what I've been hearing for the last 25 or 30 years. Who are you to tell someone else so this is, this is just fascinating to me. So I take a step back. I want to apply this to my own life. I want to look into my own life. And I think all of us, we as a culture, and I'm including all of us in the culture, I think it's time for us to take a step back and to do a little soul searching. I think it's time for all of us to take a step back and do a little self-reflection. Not the other person, but, but, but you. Because... I'm going to say we. We talk about kindness, but we seem to show no patience and no mercy. You know, you hear people, kindness, we got to be kind, kindness. But the people talking kindness have no mercy. We talk about being intolerant, but that's wrong to be intolerant. Or we, should be, we should be tolerant, but then we show no forgiveness. There's no, there's, you can't be redeemed once you, and so if we're going to talk tolerance, then we should also talk about forgiveness. If, hey, wait, I'm going to back up a second. Here's how things should work in the world. Every single person in this room and every single person listening to my voice and every single person in the world at some point or another is going to fall short, is going to slip up, is going to make some mistakes, and some big mistakes. But part of being a, a, a group of people, part of being a culture, is to forgive. I always say, like, there, there may, be, may be someone who's convicted of a crime, and they're in prison, and people say, oh, how can you go into... I say, listen, I, I'm taking them from where they are. My job as a pastor is to take people from where they are to where Christ would want them to be. Their past is between them and the Lord. Hopefully, I've walked them through repentance. They've repented. Now my job is to take people from where they are, the thoughts that they had, 
the misconceptions, the lies that they believe, whatever it is, the sins that they were, they were caught in, from where they are to where they need to be, help them grow. Isn't that what we all want? If someone is a this-ism or they're this or that, don't, don't we want to bring that person from where they are to where they... Sh- That's not the way it works, though. One misstep and cancel your life. That's why I'm saying, uh, you know, we talk about kindness, but it seems we have no mercy. We talk about tolerance, but we have no forgiveness. We talk about love, but then we seem to thrive on hatred. And, and again, I want to take a pause, and we cannot, what Paul is saying in this verse, and we'll get to the whole verse in a moment, what, what Paul is saying is that you need to think about such things, whatever's true, whatever is noble, whatever is right. I'll just stop there for now. Paul says, I don't want you just to think about them because what I want you to do is think about them. I want you to dwell on them. I want you to meditate on them. I want you to apply them to your own life so you can apply them to the lives of others. I want you to become those things, not just think about them. And in becoming those things, you become attractive to other people and they say, wow, that, I, I want what they have. That's what Paul's expressing. How do you become those things so that other people are attracted into a closer relationship with Jesus Christ? So when we talk about love, people will throw that word around. It drives me crazy. They throw the word love around. But then what I see, and and I, I seem to see a lot of, is thriving on hatred. All right, give you a perfect example. This week, coming out of the parking lot here, I drive down 42. I take a right here on Tylersville Road. I'm going toward Westchester on Tylersville Road. I live on Butler Warren. As I'm driving down the road, there's a guy in a truck, and he's got a a, a sticker on the back, a big old sticker on the back of his car for his presidential candidate. Okay? Big deal, right? It wasn't a big deal maybe 20 years ago, but he had that sticker on the back of his car for his person. That's his person. Okay, you're an American. You can have a, you can vote for whoever you want to vote for. Another car drives up, blue car, small blue car drives up behind him. She had stickers on her car too. And her stickers did not agree with his stickers. Okay, this was sticker clash. And instead of just being like to herself, you're a knucklehead, why would you think that? She rides right up on him. And she's following him. I mean, she's three feet from his bumper and they're going 50 miles an hour. She's three feet He then tries to pull off to the side to get into the neighborhood. She pulls up right alongside of him, follows him to the side. She then rolls her window. I'm watching this. She rolls her windows down, her window down. As she gets close to him, she's right next to him. She, I don't know how she was driving at this point. She's leaning on her horn. I will not do what she did, but she opens her window and with every ounce of venom in her, she sticks her hand out the window, raises one of her fingers, and she is shaking it with everything she's worth. Honking her horn, shaking her finger, cutting into his lane. This is on Tylersville. I'm sorry. There's two lanes of traffic. She startled him. Luckily, there wasn't other cars coming. He could have easily gotten to the head-on collision with the cars coming. He could have driven into a ditch. He could have been harmed. But you know what? You know what? He deserves it. Because he's wrong. And you can't have people like this driving around with bumper stickers on their car. Guys, here's what I'm saying. We cannot become like this. We all have our views. Sometimes we get overwhelmed by what we're seeing and what we're watching and what we're reading, but we cannot get so caught up that we... This is not your home. This world is not your home. You're here to glorify God. You are here to conform to the image of Jesus Christ. You are here to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Pushing someone into a ditch because they disagree with what you consider right, we cannot. 
We cannot, as followers of Jesus, this is what Paul is saying, think about such things. All these other things are over, they're causing you to be stressed. They're causing anxiety. They're causing, but you cannot allow them to take over so that you, vehement, you, you viciously attack or hate other people because of the way they think. We can't become that way. There are things that I so disagree with in people's lives, but it cannot drive me to hate that person or to treat them poorly, to be disrespectful to them. See, here's the thing about our culture, and I mean the, all of and, and so, so many people. We demand to express our views and our feelings. We demand it. It's our right. But then we become verbally or physically violent. I become, I'll just, we become verbally or physically violent if your views, if your ideas, if your thoughts are not in alignment with what I think is right. If your definition of what you believe is right is different than what I believe is right, okay, then I will become verbally or physically... Let me just explain something to you. If you cannot dialogue with, some, with someone without becoming angry and screaming at them and giving them the finger and carrying on and yelling, you don't have a position. Your position is weak. And so you use verbal aggression to get it across. If you had a strong position, you wouldn't have to do that you'd be able to sit down and let the facts speak for themselves. People who don't have a strong position scream and yell and violently go after other people. We cannot become that way. God has called us to so much more. Well, here, this is really sad, and you, I want you to think this through. What most people want now is for their thoughts and their feelings and their ideas and their views to come out of your mouth. Think about that. That's acceptable. It is unacceptable that, to, to not have that happen. I want, okay, my views, my thoughts, my ideas when we're in discussion to come out of your mouth. And if they don't, oh, there's a heavy price to pay. We cannot behave this way. We cannot get caught up in this so that we're, we're pulled into a confrontation where we should be thinking about whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely. Those are the things that God wants to think, us to think about and to become. And those things do not then project themselves as hatred and anger and venom against other people. Can we stand up for what we believe is true? You better. I, every Sunday I get up here and say, you stand your ground, but you stand your ground with love. You follow the example of Jesus Christ. He argued with the Pharisees and the Sadducees all the time. He would argue with political leaders. He would argue with religious leaders. He would argue with anyone who was wrong. But he never hated them. And he did show compassion and kindness and mercy to everyone around him. It is, so, it is so easy to be critical of others, but we need to ask, you need to ask yourself, do, do I live out with my time and with my resources what I say I believe? Am I living that out? Do I live out with my time and my resources what I say I believe? If the word of God is my truth, and it is truth, if God calls me to love my neighbor as myself, to consider others better, others better than myself, am I living that out in my life, or am I getting caught up in all this? If I find someone's choices offensive, which I do all the time, I, feel, I find people's choices very offensive, but am I respectful with, am I respectful to them as human beings? Listen, that person who I find have it, to have an offensive viewpoint is created in the image of God. Therefore, they have value. Therefore, I need to respect them as being created in the image of God. Even if nothing else, I respect them for being created by God. I need to show them that respect and I need to love them because they are created in God's image. Do I behave that way? Do I, do I love my enemy? Those people that you so disagree with, 
Do you, do you actually love, do you love your enemy? Do I show mercy and kindness, mercy and kindness to those whom I vehemently disagree with? There are some cultural uh, uh, moves, uh, you know, the movements right now that I so disagree with. Do I show kindness and mercy to those whom I, I thoroughly and vehemently disagree with? Or do I show them how, oh boy, I, you, you're ruining the country. You're ruining the country. I love my country. Don't get me wrong. I love my country. Do we have problems? Yeah, we got some big old problems. But I love my country to a point. My country doesn't supersede my God. I love my God. And God has placed me in this country, so I will protect my country, and I will love my country, and I will love those in my country and those outside of my country. But my country doesn't supersede my love for Jesus Christ. It isn't, I love the Constitution. I think it's one of the most brilliant things ever written, but it's not the Word of God. It's not the Word of God. So though I agree with it, I think it's great, um, whatever, um, that does not ultimately determine how I live my life. If I lived in another country where they had a totally different constitution, if I lived in a, in a Marxist country, I'd still be obe obeying the word of God and living my life every day in honor of Jesus Christ. I just happen to be here, and I feel blessed because I'm, I happen to be here. We need to make sure the word of God is our foundation and everything we think and everything we do and how we treat other people. The next question is even, to me, even, even more important. Is it only my opinion that an act is right or wrong, or are my views, my opinions, my perspectives, my ideas in alignment with God's truth? You got to think about this. Don't be thinking about other people. Yeah, they got to think about that. No, I have to think about that. Is it only my opinion that an action is right or wrong, or is, are my thoughts and my actions and my opinions and my perspectives and whatever else in alignment with God's word. That's what Paul is saying. I need to be in alignment with the word of God because he writes this in Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is right, whatever is noble, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So, the word that we're talking about this morning is right. The word right. Right is, is the Greek word for just. Okay, the word that is used here is a Greek word just. It's also translated in other versions of the word uh, as, as, um, as, 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 as just and righteous. So we got just and righteous. The word is used to describe a person in that culture, in the Greek culture, who was duty-bound okay, to God and to others. So we're taking this word, and what it means is, in our context here, we need to be duty-bound. Whatever is right, whatever is just, justice, righteousness, being duty-bound to obey God and to invest your lives in other people. That's the kind of behavior when it says, what, he says, think about such things, whatever is right. In other words, whatever is just, whatever is righteous, being duty-bound to the Word of God and what God tells us, we need to then invest in the lives of other people. That's the kind of behavior that God wants all of us to exhibit. Now, throughout the New Testament, it's often used to mean being upright, okay? The word means to be upright. It means to be obedient to God's law. It means to live your life, to walk in such a way, to walk a straight and narrow path. So we're talking about, again, being, being upright, being, being righteous. That's what this word means. That's what Paul's talking about here. It means to be living an innocent, and listen, an innocent and blameless life. See, let's go back. Paul's talking about whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about such things. Why does he want us to think about such things? Because he wants us to become 
those things so that we're attractive to the world and the world will come to know Jesus Christ, to be upright, to be holy, to be just, to be righteous, to walk the straight and narrow path, to be obedient to God's law. That's what he's talking about. He says, think about whatever is right. I was reading through the book of Proverbs again. And I quickly came upon Proverbs chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. And it says this, For gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair. That's what Paul's talking about. He's saying, think about what is right and just and fair. And here's the deal. He's saying, think about what is right and just and fair and not in your own eyes, but in God's eyes. So he's not concerned about what you think, what the world thinks is right and just and fair, what we perceive as right and just and fair. What he's saying is, think about what is right and just and fair through my eyes, then apply that to the people around you. That's what Paul's talking about here. And then several times, more than several times in Scripture, this word, okay, this word just or righteous, the way it's described here is used in the Hebrew and the Greek to describe God. But then again, you ask yourself, what does the word of God say? God's word says that we should become more like God. God wants us to be like him. Our goal in life is to conform to the image of Jesus Christ, to be more like Jesus Christ every single day of our lives. Every step, we become more like Christ. In 1 Peter 1.16, it says, For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. I am holy. I am these things. You need to be like me. The more like him we are, the more people will be drawn to him. Our goal is to reflect Jesus Christ in our lives. That's why we can't be hateful. We can't be merciless. We can't be unkind. We can't, we can't, we have to love people, show mercy, be kind. No matter what we're feeling or how, oh, look, they're ruining everything. They're ruining the whole country. The Bible says that a person who does not know Christ is spiritually blind or, spirit, or spiritually uses the word dead. Does it really make any logical sense to get mad at a dead person? The only way you bring people back to life spiritually is to present in a loving, compassionate way Jesus Christ to them, to share the love of Jesus Christ with them. When they receive Christ into their hearts, they are then renewed. The old has gone, the new has come. Then you can get into a spiritual conversation with folks. But before that time, does it make any sense to hate people? To ki- it make any sense to kick a dead person? To start yelling, give them the finger, riding up on their, you know what I mean? What's the point? They don't, they, they don't understand. What we need to do is lead people into a closer relationship with Christ. Then we can have these discussions. But here's the reality. Most people choose to focus not, they don't choose to focus their minds on what is just and right and fair. They choose to focus their minds on what is ease, in a life of ease, comfort, and pleasure. And, and I'm using the word happiness as a worldly form of happiness. I just want to be happy. So we spend all of our time focused on what is on a life of ease, comfort, and pleasure, and what makes me happy, instead of focusing on what is just and right and fair. And that's what God wants us to focus on from his perspective. But we, do, we kind of do the opposite. Most people don't live for God or others. And I'm talking about most people, period. Don't live for God or others. And that's what God calls us to do. We may desire in our hearts to live a righteous life, but our minds, that's why Paul's saying, think about such things. He means meditate on it, focus on it, spend time thinking, spend time driving through the word of God, understanding it. Why? Because we may have the idea that we want to be righteous in our own, we want to be righteous before God, but our minds will lead us in the opposite direction to the unrighteous. In Galatians chapter 4, Five verses 19 to 21, it says this. Now the works of the flesh are evident. 
Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. When sinful, when our sinful minds, when sinful man decides to impose their own moral views, their own moral ideas, their own set of right and wrong, what they determine, when they begin to impose that on other people, they need to remember this in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. That's why Paul tells us to think about such things. What things? Things, godly things, godly things, God's thoughts, not my own, not what I hear from television, from the news, from what I read, but God's thoughts, not my own, not someone else's. Our culture has become the moral police. It, it's fascinating to me. They become the moral police defining what is right and wrong and then condemning and judging people who do not toe the line, who will not go along with what they decided is morally true, right, and good. And if you don't do that, they will pass judgment and they will pass judgment on your life. The next time someone tells you, you judge, don't judge, holy, it's a time to step back and say, let's have a conversation about that. I find it fascinating that that sinful man will now judge the righteous laws of God. They will judge the right, and they, they are vehemently in favor of just extinguishing all of God's truth but only to replace it with their own form of morality that they now determine what's right and wrong and you must now fall in line. I I just find it absolutely fascinating, but it is God who sets the standard for what is true and right and fair. In Romans chapter seven and verse 12, it says, so the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. In Proverbs chapter 21 and verse two, it reminds us a person may think their own ways are right, but the Lord weighs the heart. God's thoughts are just and right and fair. And unlike those who create their own definition of the word right, he is merciful and he forgives us when we fall short because we all fall short. But the one who actually actually has the right to set up truth, the one who has the right to judge, the one who has the right to decide what's true and right and fair, that one, God, is merciful. And when we, when we fall short, God comes and forgives us through Jesus Christ. In Ephesians 4.32, it says, Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgive one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Through Christ, God has forgiven us. We cannot expect, like I said before, we cannot expect those who do not follow Jesus Christ to act like they do. But here as a church, at this church, here's what we can expect. Because here's the problem. The problem is that not all Christians model this, this ideal either. Don't be concerned about what these other people are, are not doing. They're, 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 they're dead in their sin. That's what the Bible says. Of course, they're not going to model this. They're not a follower of Jesus Christ. So how are they supposed to act like they are? They're not going to act like they are because they're not. But we as followers of Jesus Christ are not modeling a lot of this either. We disagree with someone. We show that same kind of venomous anger toward them. We can't live that way. We can't think that way. So I want you to bow your heads with me as we close this morning. I want you to really think about this. Some of us this morning need to repent of our unjust and unrighteous thoughts. Our thoughts, well, I didn't do anything, not what I said. You need to repent of your unjust and your unrighteous thoughts. We need to ask God to forgive us for the way that we have treated others. 
or not treated others. We need to ask God to forgive us for the poor example, for the poor example that we've set and for the way that we have dishonored Jesus Christ. He's our Lord and Savior. We obey him, and we have not been obeying him in some cases, and we need to ask God to forgive us for the fact that we have not set a good example to those who need to know Christ. So in your heart, you need to do that this morning, even right now. Ask God to forgive you for those things. But as you're asking God to forgive you, here's the good news, and I love this. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, it says this. I love this verse. My dear children, I tell you this so you will not sin. Right? So we should just not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, who's the atoning sacrifice for our sins, but not only for ours, but also the sins of the whole world. When you fall short as a follower of Jesus Christ, you ask God to forgive you, and he forgives you. You repent, and there is forgiveness. The one who sets the law, the one who is the judge, says, when you repent, I forgive you. Let's move along. You can do a better job. I'll keep, I'll keep investing in your life. So we need, some of us need to repent of the, our behavior and how we've been living our lives and the thoughts that we've had. For others, it's time to recognize your need for Jesus Christ. Listen, it's not, it's not about being right and just and fair in your own eyes. It's about being right and just and fair in God's eyes. It's about being righteous and just. And I'm telling you, that cannot happen on your own. You need Jesus Christ's blood to cover you. In Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned. You don't need a pastor and you don't need a Bible to tell you that. All you have to do is drive down the road, let someone do something you don't like, you'll find out you're a sinner. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. In Romans 10.9, it says, If you confess with your mouth, it's as simple as this, guys. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You'll be in a right relationship with God. In John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. If it's your desire this morning, whether you're in this room or whether you're listening to me online, if it's your desire this morning to be adopted into God's family, you're created by God, but you're not a child of God unless you ask Christ to come into your heart. If it's your desire this morning to be adopted into God's family, then I want you to pray this simple prayer with me. And it isn't about the exact words, it's about what's in your heart. Do you wanna walk with the Father? Do you wanna be in God's family, adopted into God's family? If that's your desire, Pray this simple prayer with me. You don't have to pray it out loud. Just pray it in your heart. Father, I recognize that I am imperfect. I am imperfect. And I'm not living a right and just life in your eyes. And I know my sin has separated me from you. And I no longer want to live my life, Lord, my God, without you. I want you as a part of my life. I can't do this without you. I want Jesus to come into my heart and bridge that separation between us. That Jesus would hold one hand up to God and one hand down to me and bridge that separation, that his blood, his righteousness, his death on the cross would cover me so that when you see me, you don't see me any longer. You see your son. You see his blood that covers me. I do confess with my mouth that he is Lord. I believe in my heart that he was risen from the dead, that Jesus has, was risen from the dead. 
And Lord, I want to give my life to you. Pray that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. And God, I pray that you would show me my purpose in this life. Show me my purpose. I love you. And today, I become your child. This is my spiritual birthday. I give my life to you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you, if you prayed that prayer this morning for the first time, if you're listening online, email me so we can connect and I can help you uh, in your spiritual growth. If you prayed that prayer for the first time this morning, I want to make sure we connect and get you on the right path as well. Um, we live in turbulent, crazy times, but we have to rise above all those things and put, put first, first things first. And first things first is, I love the Lord my God with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, all my strength. And then I love my neighbor as myself. Those are the most important things. And that's how we need to live our lives. And that's what Paul calls us to think about and who Paul calls us to be. You guys have a great, great week. I love you and I will talk to you soon again. And if you'd like to see, if you'd like to see the, the, the beginning of the construction on this um, area over here, go out the, either these doors, come back around and I'll open the door for you. You can look in there and see it. Have a great, great day.